Welcome to Mosaic Minds, the podcast where every episode is a colorful blend of perspectives, ideas, and conversation. Each week, our diverse team of hosts brings their unique backgrounds, experiences, and interests to the table. Mosaic Minds is your invitation to join the conversation to see the world through a kaleidoscope of viewpoints. So grab a seat, tune in, and let the mosaic unfold before you. You ready, Dan? I'm ready, man. All All right. right. Let's make it happen. Welcome to Mosaic Minds Podcast. My name's Nick. This is Jason. And today we have Dan Moorhead, uh, who is a professional angler. Um, He has fished, uh, he's fished the FLW Tour every year since its inception in 1996. And Dan, if any of this is wrong, make sure you tell me. This is just from the research that I did, okay? He has earned over 10 trips to the Forest Wood Cup and won the Angler of the Year title in 2003. Uh, His favorite technique is throwing a deep spinnerbait, and his favorite bodies of water are Table Rock Lake and Kentucky Lake. And when he's not fishing, he can be found bow hunting for anything that he can get a license for. He has earned over a million dollars in his career. He's had 10 career wins and uh, 56 top 10s and 14 title appearances. Does all that sound correct? Yeah, that's pretty close. I mean, we'll roll with okay. that. I think that <laughs> might be kind of old, but uh, yeah, we're, we're good. All right. Okay. Well, um, I'll go ahead and let Jason start off with the with the first question about the fishing. Yeah. So first off, you know, it's a it's an honor to have you on. Kentucky yeah. Lake's been a uh, kind of a focus maybe of this show just because I'm familiar with it. I'll make right. about seven or eight trips down there for that one. So I know. It, would you consider that to be your home body? A oh water? yeah. I've I've lived uh, I've lived here in Paducah. I'm 56 and I've lived here for 50. Three years, so yeah, I, this is. I, I mean, I've I've fished Kentucky my life, my whole life. I went to Murray State, so I I fished the southern end of it a bunch. If I had to pick one, I'm a Barkley guy. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is this is home sweet home. My grandfather fished there, you know, 50, 60 years ago, and then starting about fifteen years ago, we used to go to Hester's Resort. I don't yep. know if you've heard of that part of the lake, oh, and then I- we launch out of Moors, which. You know, I don't even need to ask you about that. I know, I know you know that part. So yeah. um, talk to me a little bit about what got your start maybe on that body of water or just fishing in general back, you know, 40, 50 years ago. Well, I guess this is going way back. But my father was an orthopedic bone surgeon. Uh, he, after, you know, after he went to Vietnam, he went to, back to medical school and became an orthopedist, and, and he lived here in Paducah. And, and he fished BASS when it very first started back in 68. 69 and uh so when i was probably three or four years old i would go with him a lot of the times and, and practice uh with him you know when i could and so i i grew up around all the greats you know i always say billy billy murray is my godfather and i'm bobby murray and roland and bill dance and all those guys and uh so i mean it was in my blood at a very very early age and, and uh i knew that i was gonna have to give this a shot and uh thank god dad was smart enough that he he made sure I continued my education and went to went to college and got a degree there at Murray, even though I well, let's just say the first semester I didn't really have it figured out. I had to repeat that semester, uh, and, and he made me he made me pay pretty hard for it. So after that, I was on the dean's list, but I actually hunted and fished <laughs> as much then as I did before. I just figured out how to play the game, you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, so I mean. You know, like I said, you know, living on Kentucky Lake, I've been here the whole time. I've seen the highs and lows and, and the ups and downs. And, uh, you know, if I had to pick anywhere in the whole world to stay, this would be it. I agree with you there. I've I've heard and kind of done a little bit of research. Do you, do you kind of agree a little bit with Kentucky Lake that it typically runs like that five-year cycle to where it kind of uptrends for five, then it maybe – dips off and then it kind of comes back or give me more insight from someone that knows rather than me just hearing bits and pieces from people that may or may not know. Well, this is all opinion. And, and I mean, that's a beautiful thing yep, about bass exactly. fishing. It's all opinion, no matter who you think yep. you are. We, I'm going to kind of address the, the, what was the elephant in the room there for a while. You know, we all blamed a lot of stuff on the Asian carp. And I mean, there's a, 
there's a hell of a lot of reasons. I think quite honestly, what what caused our latest downturn was uh, several things at one time. We had back around 2012, 13, somewhere in there, we had about three years that we had extremely high water uh, during the spring with a lot of current flow. And and you have to understand uh, the Kentucky Lake is where the catch all, where the where the you know the big basin that catches all down the whole Tennessee River chain, you know, and a lot of those lakes down through there they don't they don't let it get high and flood and, and they keep them at a, a, a level playing field. But uh, since we're the last one before they dump into the river, you know, there's so many factors that play into that. You know, if the Ohio River's blown out, they'll hold the water. If the Mississippi River's blown out, they hold the water here. And I think what happened, in my opinion, is twofold. We had we and I because I talked to a biologist friend of mine, but we had about we'll say three, but probably four years of really bad spawn. I mean, damn near no spawn. But when we had that high water with a really really heavy current flow, what that did is that that's when the Asian carp really take off. You know, they have to have high current flow for their eggs to tumble through the water column so far before they become fertile. That's one of the reasons you'll never get them out of the river. Uh, they'll always be Asian carp in the rivers no matter what. And uh, so, you know, the carp, a, a, a body of water can only support so much biomass. And it doesn't care what it is, be it Asian carp or bass or whatever. And so, I mean, that that did have a large role in it. We uh, During those high floods, we had a lot of, uh, we lost a lot of bait fish. Uh, and also, I hate to say it, but our lake's getting old. It's getting, you know, it's not as fertile as it was. It's getting a lot cleaner. Uh, we've been seeing more, you know, the, the zebra mussels kind of started making a little show. There haven't been a problem here recently. But, uh, you know, it's just uh, the lake's getting a little older. And so uh, here recently, though, you know, I don't know if you watch any of those shows I do for Jetta on the tournament reports every Monday, but, man, I'm not going to sit here and say it's, it's, it's as good as I've ever seen it because it's the, the the great big six, seven, eight, nine pounders aren't here yet. But by God, fishing on Kentucky Lake is pretty dang good right now. And and because of all those factors and the clear water and everything, as I'm sure you've well seen, the amount of smallmouth in this lake right now is absolutely unbelievable. I mean, it's. You know, and I pray we've had this once before back in the early 2000s that there was a, we had a couple three years that the smallmouth dominated and won, but the problem was is there a, a smallmouth doesn't roam and migrate like a largemouth does, uh, and that that leads me to another story I'll tell you. But but I think what happens is when a smallmouth is born or raised or spawned in a certain area, he calls that general area home. And so it becomes very easy for certain areas to get fished out. And especially in June when they have these big tournaments. And, and even though I did it for 27 years professionally, uh, you know, I have to say that my own profession had a lot to do with hurting our lakes. It's, you know, we have these long, rough boat rides. Like today, it blew 30 mile an hour. It was pretty dang bad out there on Kentucky Lake. But, you know, you catch these smallmouth after they just got done spawning. And you take them for a 20 mile boat ride and beat them, they're not going to make it. They're going to die. And uh, that's, that's the only thing I'm a little concerned of right now. The, uh, the fishermen are doing a good job. Uh, we have a lot of three fish limits and, uh, we don't have any big tournaments going on right now, uh, after the spawn. So, and the other thing is too is, is the smallmouth are, they're not localized. This the whole Kentucky Lake from one end to the other. And now, the sleeper is that a lot of people haven't figured out, and I've been trying, but there's just about as many smallmouth on Barkley now as there is on Kentucky. Uh, they're everywhere. So I don't I don't think we have to worry about, you know, the fishermen in general hurting the population of smallmouth. But, uh, you know, it was taken. It's slacked off just the least little bit now because those smallmouth aren't weighing as heavy. But, I mean, it's been taken anywhere from 22 to 27 pounds to win every week. Which is great, good. Dan. I remember uh, last year at the first BFL, I fished there with Toby there from Jetta, yeah. and yeah. Uh, good, 
very humble. I mean, he was he was really cool, and you know, I'll, I'll brag it a little bit because I don't get a chance to brag a whole lot. But I got you know, I had two fish for eight pounds. You know, uh, four and a half large and a three and a half small in the same area. I mean, I yeah. you don't catch fish like that where I'm from in Indiana. I mean, that's no, just uh, it's it, it's alive and well. And I, I keep telling people, I'm like, man, if you haven't been down there in four or five years, you owe it to yourself because ten years ago, to me, outsider looking in smallmouth wasn't nearly as prevalent like in our club if you caught a smallmouth or two smallmouth out of your five fish limit you were doing pretty good now i'm seeing tournaments one down there you know with five smallies you know nothing not no well, larges like, in there like last year the the first bfl we had last year that it was like the first week of march i did not go out targeting smallmouth uh i, I thought i had a really good largemouth fight going on and, and i ended up weighing well, it was uh, just under 22 pounds of all smallmouth and came in third. And but I mean, the top the top 10 stringers were all over 19 pounds, and they were every one of them smallmouth. And it's it was that way all all this year. You're starting you're starting to see some four and a half five pound largemouth go up. You know, and it's like I when I was doing all that high school stuff and and started that high school team and coaching and everything. Them kids didn't realize, but a five pound largemouth is, you know, pushing 10, 11 years old. I mean, that's a, that's a, a big investment in our uh, environment and a small mouth is just as, just as old. So, uh, but you know, you're starting to see a lot more of them. I know I, today, you know, I didn't have a good day. We didn't have a big weight or anything, but I bet we caught 20 keepers, you know? So, I mean, it was, a, it was fun. Uh, but, uh, I went out swinging for the fences. It was a three fish limit against a bunch of those hammers. And like I said, it blew 30 mile an hour. So I thought maybe I'd have a chance to compete against the live scope guys. You know, I'm not a hater or anything. I'm just not good at it. And uh, it just didn't work for me today, but it was fun. I, uh, I saw a, an interview that you did back in 2009 where they said that, or you'd said in the interview that if you won that particular Forestwood Cup, that I think the prize was a million dollars that you were going to retire on the spot. Was it <laughs> look at <laughs> looking back at that now? I I, I bet that would have. Uh, I bet you wouldn't say the same thing today. No, I'd probably be more apt to say it now that I've gotten older. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, there okay. you go. I like it. Fair like enough. It. It's kind like. of a big misnomer. Maybe it's to give me a chance to get it out there. But uh, I had I had to step off the road on the national level about four years ago. And my mother, God love her, had gotten, I'd lost my father in 2013. And my mother got in pretty bad health. And uh, every time I got ready to leave the house, there was something going on or medical, medical emergencies or something. And my sister lives in California. So the whole thing fell on me. So I, I just kind of faded away. I didn't make a big to do out of it or, you know, a big retirement party or anything, but I, I just had to. And, uh, you know, I don't regret doing what I did, but, you know, I've now, you know, I enjoy, I, I fish more now than I did before, because obviously I'm not doing all the sponsor related stuff, but, but I get to sleep in my own bed and I get to, you know, experience and, and that's the other thing we were talking about, but I have, I have since learned within 70 miles, a 70 mile circle where I live right here, there is a tremendous amount of lakes and different, you know, different styles of fishing I can do, uh, and, and I love it. Uh, so, but I, I will say after, you know, four or five days solid on, on the water fishing, uh, yeah, if I want a million dollars tomorrow, I probably would retire. Back <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Dan, I'm not afraid to tell you, you know, as a co-angler, I'm a, I'm a weekend warrior. I mean, just to walk you through and, and, uh, you know, you're blessed to live where you do, but you know, I get off work on a Friday after a full day's work and I'm no different than a lot of other co-anglers and some anglers, you know, I'll drive 275 miles stay 15 miles away, fish an eight hour day and drive five hours home. And that's paradise down there because you can run, I might be off on my directions or whatnot, but it's 90 or hundred miles long from end to end. And I'm probably short on that, but I mean, it's that, that's, that's a lake, you know, and here you run into end in some of our waters, you know, in a short time. So expand upon, you know, having that as your home lake over those years, how, how blessed you are to be fishing that all the time. Well, like I said, Kentucky Lake is 140 miles from end to end, and Barkley is roughly 80 or 90. And uh, the thing you'll find is I've always said that there's actually six lakes here instead of two it's because they're, they're far enough apart that they, they, there's certain areas just totally fish different. Uh, 
you know, we have the, the northern end of Kentucky is more deep. Uh, the mid, what I call mid or in between the bridges, you can kind of do both. There's a lot more shallow water. Then you run down there, way down there, way south below Paris, you know, 15, 20 miles below Paris, it turns into a whole completely different animal. Uh, a lot shallower, a lot more river bars. Used to be a lot of grass, no grass anymore, but it's the same deal on Barkley. Uh, you know, I would say from the dam to Catawba fishes a lot more like north end of Kentucky. Then you have the midsection that, that's different, and then you get down below way down below 68 bridge down there and it turns more into like river style fishing so i mean you know that's just it and it's uh and it's no different than i don't know if you kept up with it, like lake the ozarks I, that used to be one of my all-time favorite lakes and i've had a lot of success there but you could also you know even on a three-day practice if you didn't find that four or five or three mile section of the lake where they're really biting you could you're lost i mean you you know Yep. And it's the same way here. You could easily go out there and fish hard for three days and just never find the right sex. So, I uh, got to be careful here because I know I'm talking to a legend down there, and I'm probably going to be show my show my color as a rookie. But if you're looking at the dam and you're facing the dam, and I'm going to say you go back right from the dam, there's that bridge off there to your left down. I'm going to tell you about a half mile to a mile, and then there's the barge looking barrels. Do you kind of know that? I mean, you know that secondhand. The greatest experience I've had in fishing on Kentucky Lake was the wildest thing. We were in a tournament, and hopefully I make you laugh a little bit. Remember that Chuck Woolery lure that was all goofy that had that plastic tail when you pulled the string on it? Yeah. I had one of those in my tackle box, and I pulled up towards that bridge, and we called it a little teacup. So if you know where I'm talking about that, uh, I do. You've, got the, you've got the bridge on the right. That little teacup was swirling because they were pulling uh -huh. water real hard. We caught 11 topwater fish in probably 15 minutes, and I'm a topwater fanatic. And uh, I right. never will forget that because my partner had to go back, you know, and with a second place finish and say Jason caught him on a little play toy, you know, with a little plastic <laughs> tail on the back. But I, that was always a great memory because it was just so random. And, uh, you know, in, in results to the lake and how they were pulling the water, I think you could have thrown a stick in the water and probably pulled in as many fish as I did with that goofy lure, you know, for about a 15, 20 minute. And then after yeah. that 15 to 20 minutes, as you well know, it was back to reality and, you know, had to work hard to catch them in, in different spots. Do you, so, Do you remember by chance, and this has been a while back, Roland Martin came out with a a lure, a kind of a gimmicky lure. I think they called it, the, I don't remember if it was a tornado or the twist, but it had a helicopter. It was a helicopter lure. And yep. it, would, it would rotate when you threw it in. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yep. Yeah. I fished that. I fished a bay today. I was in there. I think about that every time I go in there. I was fishing a red man back then. It was so long ago, and it was a good old Kentucky Barkley Lake flipping bushes with thirty pound test, a big jig, you know, short line full combat. And uh, I was catching some fish, and I drew this guy, and he had one of those helicopter lures on, and I kind of chuckled. I like, oh, I'm fixing to fill this guy what for, and he pitched in a bush and caught a six pounder, and I was like, hmm, okay. I didn't think anything about it. One lucky cast, right? And I didn't go another 10 yards. He caught another six pounder behind me on that helicopter. He's like, you want one? I'm like, hell no, I don't want one. I'm, like, nope, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> the, the first so time I had heard your name, about. you'll appreciate this. The first time I heard your name, I was down there about 10 to 15 years ago and I'd studied fishing and I knew a little bit about fishing, but I didn't know Kentucky Lake a guy named Jeff Thompson. Uh, he yeah. fishes the uh, PVA tour. Uh, he's got the red, white, and blue boat. You would probably know of him. Uh, I know once you shook his hand, you'd probably know him. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. So he's like literally, uh, this was the bank. And I'm not going to give coordinates, obviously, but you know, this was the bank. And he mentioned your name. And I kind of started doing some research. And I'm like, man, that's amazing that somebody's fished this fishery, knows every step of it. And every time I go there, like to me, fishing inside the Moors Resort as a club tournament was yeah. natural. Now it's funny that we're launching out of that and you can't go in there for obvious reasons because I think we were catching some of those fish that had been there or maybe caught. But at the, at the end of the day, that was always a great uh, a great place to fish towards the end of the day if you needed your last kicker or your last fish, you know, just buzz up in there, throw it on the rocks and, and walk out of there, you know, with a pretty good, pretty good stringer. So I know you do some stuff away from fishing for like high school clubs. I don't want to speak out of turn, but do you do like some, maybe some skeet shooting or something maybe hunting related with a high school club? 
Well, I, again, I started the uh, I started the high school fishing here at the big high school. I started it in honor of my father after he passed, and then my daughter, my daughter went through the whole thing, and, and of course I was at the time I wasn't a full head coach because I was always going on the road, and but I did I went through that with her for the whole nine yards, and we traveled and fished, you know, abroad to all the FLW uh, high school events and. Uh, went to nationals and, and I look back on that and that's some of my fondest memories. Quite honestly, at that point in my career, that, that saved my career because it had gotten to the point where it was a job. I can't say that I was excited to get up and go fishing. Uh, you know, it was just the, the travel and all that. And that, and that brought it fun again. It reminded me why I loved it. And, uh, and you know, like I said, I think our best was we came in third nationals and made $90,000 scholarship, you know, to go, uh, through fishing so I, I tell you that but she graduated and i've got a i had a son and i don't i don't know if yours are like that but anything one of mine excels at the other one wants no part of it and so yeah uh, oh, yeah. they want their his, own thing his, yeah <laughs> yeah his love was crap shooting and so they happened to start a, a team there to high school and i became an assistant coach and uh, i did that for seven years and now I'm, I took it over and I'm the head coach, even though my son graduated a year ago. And so, yeah, every Monday and Tuesday we're, we're shooting around and uh, I got to brag on my bunch. I've got 28 kids on the team, but we, we've got seven of the top, the top seven kids in the state of Kentucky are on my team and uh, they don't miss. They're, they're dang good. Uh, so we're having fun. Stuff like that just means so much because, you know, I've, I've talked with you just briefly, casually, you know, you know of me, I believe, and, and vice versa. And the thing yeah. about it is, is like your humility is there. You know what I mean? You, uh, you know, I'm going to give you an honor, you know, a compliment to, you know, you, you treated me kind of like you'd known me for a little while. You know, you, you had time for me, you know, you, I saw your family there at the weigh in, you know, this would have been last BFL, uh, first, first BFL of the year last year, just to kind of date that tournament that you did very well and Toby did very well at that tournament, you know, the first tournament down there, but, uh, it's just a great fishery. Is there, uh, is there any fisheries that you, um, let's, let's not focus on the ones you love. Is there any fishery that you maybe, uh, would like to have a second shot at, or just kind of a, Hey, if I would have done a little bit better, I might've had a different result at maybe. Damn near everyone I fished in the last 30 <laughs> years, I always want another shot at. I mean, there's, there there's a couple there I go. hope I never, ever see again in my life. I can say that for sure. I, if, if they schedule a big tournament on the Pascagoula River down there, I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you I'm go. saving my money and my time. I'll just stay home. But I don't know. I mean, I've always had uh, – I guess the ones that hurt the worst is I've been very blessed. I've won three big national tournaments here on Kentucky Lake. Uh, FLW, you know, the tour events and everything. But I've also had probably that many or more that I was, you know, really close second or in the top five that I should have won here at home. And, uh, you know, that hometown curse is rough because you go to fishing memories and then you second guess yourself what you could have, should have, might have done or tried this or done that or fished this spot or left this spot a little quicker. I mean, you know how that goes. You can what if yourself to death. So those are the ones that, that kind of get to me after a while. But uh, there was one, I'll never forget this. Uh, Anthony Gagley already won the tournament here. And it, the first day of the tournament, it was rough. It was bad rough on Kentucky Lake. But they, it was uh, uh, early June, and those fish were just coming out on the ledges. It was back when it was good. And I made a, I made a pretty good run, and uh, I caught three five-pounders on my first stop. And I came out, and this was this was in the olden days when we had didn't have all the good equipment like we do now. But I came out. Uh, oh, hold on a second. Okay, good. I got a friend of mine fished the tournament. I know I'm gonna have to send him a text because he'll wear me the heck out. But uh, but no, I came out of the bay, and I had the trolling motor all the way down on the bracket because of the waves were kind of bad. And I hit one just right, and I separated the shaft. You know, it used to be in those men coaches that had that big bearing and, and the two shafts separated. So now I just, I don't have a trolling motor. It's just flopping in the wind. And I had to tie that thing down with rope and make it back 20 miles to Kentucky Dam Marina. And I either had the option of throwing my three fish back and taking my dad's boat, which was sitting there, 
or wait and the service crews were eating breakfast and they were a little late getting back uh and then let them fix it and go on long story short i waited they got me fixed real quick and got me back on the water but i lost about three hours i missed the cup by one ounce and mm. I, I just i'd love to have that one to do over again so they were biting that big spinner bait and that's my forte i was fixing to give them what for and it just it didn't work out so so i know uh we did a little bit of research but uh this might be a little bit of flashback from the the past there it looks like you were on a cereal box yeah i got it up there on the wall <laughs> Back in uh, 2003, I, I fished. I like, uh, like, like he said, I fished FLW uh, from the conception. Hell, they weren't even. They were. I think they were called pro ams back when they first started in '96. And uh, so I fished. I started fishing BASS in '93, I guess. And I made. I fished six years in bass. Made three classics, and then when I had the, when I had my two kids, or my, I had my daughter, and. Uh, 2000 i had it was just too much i mean i fish in both circuits and so i stepped away in 2002 uh, and i just concentrated my efforts on flw because all my sponsors lined up better not to mention you know they're they're headquartered here 18 miles away from me and uh i won angler of the year in 2003 and won i won that beaver lake two hundred thousand dollar tournament and uh they put me on the cornflakes box my, my wife says it should have been a fruit loop but <laughs> but either way, I was on, on, on cereal box. <laughs> there you go. So um, the question I have for you is, is we like to always give the audience a sense of like, you know, we've talked Kentucky Lake, we've talked fishing. You've talked a little bit about what you like to do. Is there anything that we haven't brought up up to this point? Maybe hobbies or anything? Maybe um, kind well, of expand, expand from there. Archery. Um, it's hard to see it, but I, I found when I built this man cave, finally, uh, I've got my own uh, indoor archery range right here, and and I used to. I never was a professional or anything like that because you can't you can't do that and be on the road as much as I was. But I used you know, I used to carry my bow with me all the time on the road and practice. But but I, I love you know like like you read earlier, I love to hunt anything you can buy a license for with a bow. Uh, when my kids were a lot younger than they are now, I I'd, I'd try to take at least two big trips every year and you know, travel and hunt and moose and caribou and elk and bear and everything. So I've done a lot of that. And uh, now, now I just kind of, cause they both, they both love to hunt quite a bit too. So I just take, I save that money and put it into my, I've got a place in Illinois that I inherited uh, not too far away. And so, but we do a lot of hunting, mainly bow hunting, but we like to hunt pretty much everything we can. So I got to ask you, I noticed uh, when I was when I was looking, trying to look up, doing a little bit of research, I noticed on Facebook that um, we had a couple mutual friends and Uh-oh. one of them. Yeah. One of, so one of them was my he's actually passed away, but um, was my cousin, Gene Green. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, he, over the Wheeler mission in, in uh, Indianapolis. And so yeah. I was just curious. I was like, I wonder how he knows Gene, you know? I got to know a bunch of that uh, Indiana, Southern Illinois bunch. Uh, who Mike McDonald used to be our ranger rep, and then uh, you know, and then a lot of them always showed up down here fishing tournaments. You know, yeah, you know, they always, they always yeah. I mean, I, he did fish, so yeah, yeah. I think uh, I remember. If I'm not mistaken. He was good friends with Charlie Conway. You remember him? I don't remember. See, Gene was quite a bit. So he was really like more like a second or third cousin. He, um, he, he knew my, my folks a lot better than, than he knew me, but his, actually his wife, um, still goes to, she goes to our church and everything. So, you know, see, see her every week, but I just thought that was, I thought that was interesting that since you don't live in Indiana that, you know, that you guys knew each other. Well, I mean, it goes what, you know, he was talking about a minute ago. I look at this, I mean, we're all, we're all, red-blooded american brethren and we all love the same thing you know i mean be it you know god bless trump the second amendment and bass fish the way i look at it but, but you know <laughs> but uh you know he, 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 i've run into people all over the united states you know from around here we all like i said pursue fishing and hunting it it seems like a big old world but it seems like we always gather the same places so well, it's funny. That's something that we and we were just talking about this with our with our last interview. But it's funny you realize you, some of the people that you talk to, 
that you maybe would have never talked to before had you not, you know, reached out to him and, and got him on for an interview. But, you know, you're right. You know, everybody's everybody's the same, like, and everybody pretty much acts the same. You know, people aren't, we haven't had anybody yet that's acted like that they're, you know, above above us or, or anything like that. You know, everyone's just really yeah. down to earth. So it's well, really you know, cool. Yeah, well, and for, for people for people out there that don't know what live scoping is, can you kind of explain that? So what they're doing is they're using this forward-facing sonar technology, uh, and it's uh, it's just another way of you know using your electronics and 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 they're like again it's forward-facing and they're getting out there to where I've spent my whole life rhyme and reason and looking at seasonal p- migrations and patterns and the you know fish are following the bait fish and they they stage out here in the summertime on the main lake and then they'll go back in the bays and, and spawn and and they've proven me completely wrong. They'll go out there and they'll find a flat, might be anywhere from six to eight foot of water out there on the main lake, in the current, everything that I didn't think a fish would spawn around. And they're using that forward facing sonar and they're literally these guys are so good. I mean, I can't fathom to you how good these guys I've talked to are. I mean they are physically watching these fish spawn out here in eight foot of water around a rock. I mean, that's what they're, that's what they're targeting. They're not looking for a drop off or a creek channel or a brush pile or, or what I would consider true structure. They're just out there randomly drifting with the wind using their forward facing sonar. Oh, damn it. Can you hear me? <laughs> I, we can hear you. You can go ahead. You can go ahead. It's They're using, uh, they're using this sonar, and they're they're physically watching these fish spawn. I mean, they can tell you that's a six pounder, and there's a three pound male guarding the bed, and and, <laughs> wow. and catch the fish and show you. I mean, it's they're that damn good. And uh, you know, like I said, I mean, I, I for years I've run by those areas and thought, well, you know, there's there's nothing out there. I'm wrong. <laughs> I saw a guy, you know, from the back of the boat, he would throw about 40 feet in front of him. He would throw an A-rig, right? And then he would pull in 20 feet away and throw a jerk bait. Then he'd pull in about six feet or four feet from him and throw a worm. So to take that a step further, you know, I, I let's stay away from it, if you will. But I just thought that was an interesting way to fish. And then you follow on that up and it's tough. Let's just, let's just leave it at that from the back of the boat. It's tough, but I think there's, I think there's value added, but I, I don't, I don't disagree with you. How's that sound? You know, we got to appease most people, but you know, it'd be oh, nice mean, to see it. Cause I, I've been to a tournament before where it's darn near a small screen TV screen, you know, for that. I mean, oh. the screen had to be 19, 22 inches wide, more money than <laughs> I could probably buy a car with what the electronic costs, but you can't, you can't blame it if you got it and it, and you can use it, go with it, you know? Well, so. I mean, it's, 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 come, it's, it's come to the point now. If, especially if you're on the national level and everything, it's put you in a situation that you don't have a choice. Uh, yeah. I was talking to one of my friends. He's running seven lithium batteries. He's got five units. He's got three <laughs> transducers on the scrolling motor, forward facing. He's got one on the back, off the jack plate for perspective mode. He's got thirty grand worth of electronics. And he's got those, you know, the trolling motors on the power poles to stop you. And I mean, yeah, you know, I don't know what to say. I mean, if I was still <laughs> yeah. doing it professionally, I'd probably still have it too. But all right, exactly. But, but I mean, now you know. I mean, hell, I, I'm as proud of this boat as can be. It's probably one hundred twelve thousand dollars, and now their their boats are all running one hundred forty. I mean, who's, you know, where <laughs> get their fishing stop? yachts? <laughs> I got a I I got a question for you. I got a question for you. So on my level, you know, I'm not, a, I don't care who knows it on the air or any fans or, or lack thereof. I've never placed higher than like a 14th on a BFL tournament. So, you know, kind of what scale I'm at. How do you feel when you're up there on a hot seat or maybe six or eight guys to weigh, or you kind of already know maybe that, Hey, I got this one. What's that feeling of just, uh, they're announcing you, they're giving you that large check. You're kind of you know, I'm going to be quiet from there because it's something I'll never get to experience on that level if I live three lifetimes. But expand upon that, man. Give give me a little bit of insight for us casual fishermen out there. I guess looking back on some of them, uh, the first one I won was a, a BASS Top 100 at the Potomac River, and it was in '96 October. Uh, I got married the next month to my wife, and uh, 
at that point in my career, you know, I was still pretty young and and I mean I guess I guess everybody a lot of people knew who I was, but I hadn't really solidified myself yet. At least at least this is the way I felt. And when I won that tournament and um uh, at that point I I won it with I had over sixty pounds for three days, which was a pretty big feat on, on the Potomac. And and it just it solidified my place. I felt like that, you know, I felt like I belonged there then. Uh, I, you know, I'll, if that makes any sense, that uh, I'd maybe earn my, I could take my rookie stripe off, I guess, put it that way. When I, when I won the, when I won the big FLW on Kentucky Lake in 98, and at that time they drove us all the way to Paducah uh, to weigh us in at the Walmart. And they still say to this day that it was probably one of the biggest weigh-ins that they'd ever had at a, a tournament. And I would say 90% of them were my friends and they were all there to see me. And, and, you know, yeah, we, you know, they had those different ty- styles of, you know, you know, knock off the, the hot seat guy or however they weighed them in at the time. But, but we'd all been back there in the bunk tanks, you know, and, you know, you know, a bunch of fishermen are, they're like little kids. We're, we're looking at each other's bags. Oh yeah. I think you got me. Oh, you know, and, and, uh, I, I knew, I knew I had that one. And, and if you ever get a chance to watch the show, you can see it on my face. My wife knew, I mean, but, uh, that was, that'll be the epitome. Unless I won the Bassmaster Classic or the Sportswood Cup, which is not going to happen because I'm not fishing that anymore. That, that's the epitome of, of my career. Uh, that was cool. I had, I had no less than 35 or 40 guys follow me everywhere I went that day on the water. You know, my buddies that I'd fished against forever. And, and of course, I burnt every good little spot I had, my little hidey holes. But, I mean, you know, well, 100 grand riding on the line, you do what you got to do, right? Yeah, you do what you got to do. Exactly. I, uh, I'm i going to tell you a funny story, um, and then we'll uh, kind of let you wrap it up with us a little bit. But the funny story that I have for you is I was at the Super Tournament last year, and I was top 20. I got lucky and stuck a couple fish. As you well know, it doesn't always take a lot of weight as a co-angler. Um, but I called my wife and I was just following what I thought was the literal rule. And I'm going to say it out loud. I just called her and said, I can't really tell you what's going on, but I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a day later than I told you I was going to be. And I ended the call and, uh, I'm going to give you the unedited version. But the next day I was on my way home and she's like, you dumbass. I thought you got arrested or I thought, you know, somebody <laughs> kidnapped you or something. And, and, and looking back, it was so funny because for obvious reasons, you're not really supposed to talk fishing or solicit information, which you well know, but I took that very literal. So she still gives me a, a hard time over that. So that's just kind of a funny, funny fishing story. Um, the question I have for you is if somebody wants to follow you or come in contact with you or, uh, maybe, um, network with you where do we find you maybe social media in general maybe mention a sponsor too if you want to and uh and we'll go from there yeah i'm doing a deal i started it uh this, this is my second year uh and we're getting ready to me and a friend of mine are getting ready to branch out and do do some more youtube stuff and he's even trying to talk me into doing some form of a tv show i'd I'm not making any promises on that kid, <laughs> but maybe, but I mean, right now it's Facebook and I, and I do a deal every Monday. Uh, we go back and look at tournament results throughout the, you know, we'll start them in early February and I'll do them all the way until usually the first week of November when everything kind of wraps up around here as far as tournaments. We do that. Uh, most of that's on my personal page on Facebook. But also Jetta Marina, Jetta Marina, uh, does a, all all that and uh, we do a lot of interviews with the local hot hands around here there and, and a lot of times believe it or not they they tell all that that's the other thing is kind of scary i used to be there 20 years ago but when you're so damn good and you're confident that you tell all you know you got it going on you know what i'm saying <laughs> but uh that 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 clint knight kid uh he's so good yeah he'll tell you whatever you want to know he doesn't care because he knows he's he wakes up every morning with 20 pounds in the bed with him. <laughs> so. Well, as you well know, you know, my, the, the bait that I have has been down there for about 30 years. So that's always spoke, you know, it's always spoke highly of uh, the lake itself. My grandfather was there 50 or 60 years ago. And to me, it's the, it's the Mecca that I like, you know, I can't, I can't travel to the Texases, the, the Californias and stuff like that. But Kentucky Lake for me in the Midwest, you know, 275 mile drive, it's just that serenity and going down and, uh, 
you know, I've got a lot of family in Kentucky in the Harrodsburg area, Lexington, Salvisa. That's kind of where my family is from. So I like, uh, I like getting down there. So it's been a pleasure talking with you. Yeah. I, th- I think this was enjoyable and it's always good to talk with the legend of the lake there at Kentucky Lake and, uh, wish you the best in your future endeavors and just keep killing it. Keep being a genuine person. Keep being a nice person, giving back to your community. I think that's a tip of my cap to you and uh, look forward to seeing you at future events. All right, y'all take care. See, see, see you back.